Shavasti, I'd like to ask you about those people that have it all and then lose it all. Mm. Each of the questions that you ask are so broad in themselves. And what I mean by that is there could be a hundred people in the audience where that has happened. And if each of them were to come for a private session and to ask that question of me, I would give a slightly different answer, or maybe even a totally different answer to each of them. But there is a general broad theme that I recognize with individuals. Having it all, then losing it all, often comes from a hidden loyalty. Mm -hmm. So let's say that you are the, the child of a mother who was never happily married. Let's say your father died when you were quite young. Or let's say that your mother gave birth to a severely disabled or sick child and her whole life has been dominated by being unhappy, being miserable, struggling with something, or being unhappily married. I have seen many individuals then sabotage their own wealth and happiness for the unable to say deep in their heart, Mother, please bless me if I have the courage to be happier than you. In fact, if you're listening to this video, you might even want to imagine saying that to your mother or to your father. Please bless me if I have the courage to have more or to be happier than you. That brings up a lot for a lot of people. So that's part of it. Some of it can also be transgenerational and in nature. Let's say your ancestors gained financially through the losses of others, ill-gotten gain. Mm -hmm. So let's say your ancestors were slave owners, or let's say your ancestors moved on to land where the original peoples had been displaced. That's true for many countries around the world. And so there can be an ancestral or transgenerational guilt that trickles down through the generations where we deny ourselves having it all or take it away. So we achieve and lose, we achieve and lose, and we achieve and lose owing to guilt or a subconscious loyalty to those who have suffered. And those who have suffered can be family members, they can be family members from a generation or two back, or from several generations back. Or if we're from a new country, or a country that's been populated by another group, by another dominant group, a feeling of guilt towards those who were displaced, or those who suffered genocide. Mm -hmm in order to make space for your ancestors. I'm not suggesting that anyone should feel guilty for the actions of the previous generations, of course not. But I'm saying that it is subconscious and these loyalties are there. So that's the first two. The third one is, as I've discussed in previous videos, about not having received enough. If you don't receive enough, you can't hold enough. It can't be held. Because when we're born, in an ideal situation, we're born to a mother who feels whole and complete within herself, and to a father who feels whole and complete within himself. And their relationship feels whole and complete, each of them having their needs met equally. And the child is then held in what Almas calls merging love. And so we're infused with the love of mother and father. When that doesn't happen, we experience what I call drip-fed trauma, a little bit each day. Disappointment after disappointment after, after disappointment. Because our parents have their own traumas, and so did our grandparents. And so we've all witnessed what it is to be in the presence of an inconsolable child. So that's what happens with the inconsolability. Because it is an unbearable feeling, it becomes locked away. And so our ability to receive is then limited. 
because we shut down certain feelings. And that feeling is that of separation, of disappointment, of not enoughness. So that's the third part to the answer. Then there's another part as well. What many overachievers, I don't actually mean overachievers, but those who will have achieved much more than their peers. Mm -hmm. So I'm not trying to suggest that they achieve too much. Mm -hmm. But people use that term, overachievers. And so what many high achievers have hidden within them is self-hatred. Mm -hmm. I'm not enough. It's never good enough. I can never have enough. And so what happens is the achievement of something becomes the antidote to try and numb the worthlessness and the self-hatred. It's used as an anesthetic to do that. Having said that, I'm not saying that great wealth and great achievement is all because of that. I'm not saying that at all. So what I want to make clear here is that when I talk about those who are very high achievers, what some people would call an overachiever. Um, I'm not saying anything against that which is achieved. I'm not saying anything against having a wonderfully successful career or earning a very, very large salary or very, very high income. There's nothing against that at all. However, if the creation of all of that comes from a place of needing and wanting to fill the not enoughness, then many problems can arise. Either it's never enough, and so it doesn't matter what you've achieved, it's never good enough. It's always got to be better. There's always got to be more. Or it cannot be sustained meaning that the emptiness, the feeling of imperfection, the feeling of worthlessness eventually catches up with you. And it may not ca catch up in a conscious way, but in a subconscious way. And everything that we have created simply begins to dissolve. So we are vibrational beings. So our chakras that have many dimensions and levels to them have vibrations within them. And it is these vibrations that create within the reality that we are sitting in. And so if all of that achievement has come from this will and creating top heavy energy and a very well developed sol solar plexus, if all of that energy has come from that place of the drive to achieve, to prove that I'm not empty, to prove that I'm something, to prove that I'm someone, to prove that I am worthy. If it's all coming from that place, there are normally re consequences for that. Either we're, we are like a hamster on the wheel and we exhaust ourselves because of more and more and more and more and more. Because it doesn't matter how much we try to put into that empty hole, it's an abyss. It can never be satisfied. Or we simply cannot sustain it or we have all the money in the world and we're alone without any meaningful relationships through which we connect to life, to people, to hearts, etc. Now some would take everything that I've said and then use that to speak against those who've got money or wealth, etc. But this applies to everybody. None of this is new. None of this only applies to those who've achieved a lot. This applies to those on low incomes or no incomes as much as it does to people on very, very high incomes. Mm -hmm. There are many on low incomes that are very envious of those with very, very high incomes. And so the problem is essentially universal. But when we begin to find that place that feels so empty, 
and we face that which we've been running from our whole life, be that emptiness, be that a sense of worthlessness, be that shame, be that self-hatred, be that the belief that ultimately I'm all alone, once that has been faced and met, all of the life force energy that's locked away in the abyss, keeping those terrible feelings at bay, can be released. And that is a lot of life force energy. And with that life force energy, our magnificence, the magnificence of the human being, and the magnificence of the human heart, and the magnificence of human creativity suddenly flourishes. And then it doesn't matter how much we have, we always feel enough. Because not all of us want the same thing. For you, enough could be a log cabin on a mountain somewhere. For me, enough could be a penthouse suite in the middle of a big city. I personally wouldn't want that, but I'm giving that as an example. For some people, it's a location. For some people, it's the countryside. For some people, it's the mountains. For other people, it's the beaches. Mm -hmm. Or the perfect relationship. Or the perfect relationship. And so having it all is about everything around us being enough. And it's about what can we let in. And whatever isn't coming in, I can assure you that shame is standing in the way. Where have we been shamed? Where have we felt shame? If they really knew who I was, they wouldn't love me. If they really knew how I felt, they wouldn't like me. And so many individuals with great wealth have difficulties in knowing the quality of their friendships. Are they my friend because I'm wealthy? Are they my friend because I'm a movie star? Are they my friend because I'm a prince or a princess? Are they my friend because I'm a politician? Are they my friend because I have more than them? Or because I'm female? Or because I'm white? Or because I'm black? Or because I'm Chinese? Or because I'm good at maths? And so when we achieve a lot, often there can be a question mark of, am I liked for who I am? And that is a question that's always present if what we are doing, we are doing that in order to compensate for the emptiness. If we come from our own innate magnificence, feeling complete and fulfilled with what it is that we do, then our heart is open and it is shining. And it is from that place we have a greater discernment for who it is that we connect with, for the friends that we make. And then it's always enough. Then it is always enough. So can we have it all? Yes. When we understand that we are enough, that we are enough, that you are enough, that I am enough, that each person is enough. But that isn't a mental process. You can do all of the affirmations that you wish. It doesn't work. This inner kind of work is beyond the realm of the mind. It's rather amusing that the mind thinks that it can become enlightened. It cannot. Enlightenment sits outside of the mind. It is not even within the realm of the mind. The heart is not even within the realm of the mind. And so there are many teachers and many teachings out there that are talking about clear thought. Yes, it's very good not to have junk in your head and to be you know, thinking about problems that are not even your business, of course. Of course, I'm not speaking about clearing, not speaking, I'm not speaking against clearing up your thoughts. But what I'm saying is, don't try and get your mind to do something that it cannot possibly do. The mind does not live in the realm of the heart. The mind does not live in the realm of spirit. 
and enoughness, our completeness, our magnificence does not lie within the realm of the mind. It is not a concept. You cannot affirm it with saying, I love myself, or saying these mental affirmations. Better that than to have mental clutter, I agree. And so the invitation here is to cease trying to get your mind to do something that it will never be able to do. It cannot achieve something that is within the kingdom of the heart. And the heart is a kingdom. It is a very rich place. It contains everything that we are and it contains everything that is and all of our magnificence and all that we are capable of achieving. And when we achieve from that place, it's enough no matter what we do. No matter what we do. No matter what we do. Because the greatest wealth is the wealth of the heart. There is no greater wealth than that. And so when you feel wealth in your heart, look what happens to your wealth. And it is shared with generosity. So that's what I would like to share. Thank you, Shavasti.